Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Woo! All right. Elders on point this morning. All right. So it's great to see everybody this morning. I don't know what day it is in the month of July, but welcome to High Hill Christian Church. We are so happy to have you with us this morning. As we prepare to praise the name of God, we just ask that you would come on down to your seats, finish grabbing your coffee, donuts, your hellos, your howdies, your high fives. However it is that you say good morning to those around us this morning, we invite you to do so. And as we prepare, we're going to stand up. Um, again, we've got empty rows in the front. I don't know what it is with y'all. I'm always so alone up here. Nobody? Okay. Well, we are going to go ahead and stand up and prepare our hearts for worship. I'm going to say a quick prayer as we do that, just so that we can kind of center ourselves and we can let go of some things before we praise him. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this morning, for this beautiful weather that we have, for the people in this room, for the talents and the passions and the hearts that you have brought together. Father, we invite your spirit into this space. We ask that you would let us unload the things that we have brought into the room that are distracting us from you. Let us leave them outside or you can take them and just hold on to them for us while we're here, just so that we can focus on your word and on each other and on praising your name. Father, we love you, and it's in the Son's name that we pray. Amen. I cast my mind.
It's been a couple months now since Easter, but that was one of my kind of early Sundays here. And so just kind of an important day for me. And in general, it's always been important as I grew up in a church kind of like this on Easter Sunday. And so this um, hymn, Amazing Grace, has always been something that um, has resonated with me. It's just been something I've clung, clung to over the years. And this is kind of a new version of it, but it says in the chorus, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. And that's what we remember each week that we celebrate communion. And so we invite you to worship with us and move your hearts into that remembrance space. All these pieces, broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty-handed, but not forsaken, I've been set free, I've been set
cross for us. We just bring our hearts this morning in praise. We thank you for this time. It is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's very nice to see you all here today. It makes me happy. I hope you're happy to be here. In June 1873, a cholera outbreak devastated Nashville. Despite city leaders' attempts to downplay the severity of this situation, within three weeks, all of those who could afford to had left the city to escape the danger, they did. The disease devastated those who remained, especially the city's black population. While many of the city's well-to-do residents fled to the countryside to uh, wait out the danger, not everyone who could leave did. One of those who stayed was David Lipscomb, a local pastor. Lips, Lipscomb was horrified by the condition of his fellow citizens, citizens, white and black, and felt compelled to help by putting his faith into action. Lipscomb volunteered to drive doctors, nurses, and relief workers to places of need with his horse and wagon. Before long, Lip, Lipscomb, I can't have, I'm having a hard time saying that, Lipscomb was joined by other members of his church who felt compelled to serve their neighbors. Writing in the local newspaper, Lipscomb courageously called his fellow citizens into action in the name of Christ and condemned the racial prejudices of the day, he said. It is time that you should call out the full coverage and energy of the church in looking after the needy. Every individual, white or black, that dies from neglect and, want a pro and, want, and the want of proper food and nursing is a reproach to the professors of the Christian religion. Lipscomb's boldness and dedication to service were a genuine outgrowth of his faith. The example of Christ's life, death, and resurrection compelled him and others to put their faith into action on behalf of others. For them, the grace of God was not a prize to display, but a call to duty to share Christ's love with everyone, especially those in need. Today, as we come to communion, let's remember that Christ's life, death, and resurrection aren't just facts to know and believe or a way to achieve special status, but an example of service and love to follow. Let's resolve that compassion and service in the name of Christ won't just be part of our heritage, but also a vital part of our future. Jesus commands, Jesus' command is this, love each other as I have loved you, John chapter 15, verse 12. Each week, when we take the bread, we remember how Jesus gave his body for us in our place for our sins. If you have your bread ready, take it with me. The juice or wine reminds us of Jesus' blood that was shed for us. If you have your juice ready, take it. We also testify that he really did rise from that grave, that he conquered death, and if we will accept the forgiveness he offers, we no longer need to fear that grave or those sins. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your love. May we look to your example and daily pursue service and love to all of those we encounter. Jesus, as we remember your sacrifice on the cross, we are compelled to sacrifice for those around us. May our lives be a living sacrifice as we love out loud to those in our own homes, our church, and our own community. In Jesus' name we pray.
with your Bibles and hold them, open up to uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. Oh, All right. Of course, there's only one man who has the magic touch. And I saw it with my own eyes. Like when he gets up here and he touches this, it's perfect. So, I got an idea. How'd that, that fix it? Tell you, maybe. All right. So. to uh, Houston, Missouri, here in another uh, couple weeks. We're moving to Houston, Missouri in a couple weeks. Is this on? Can you hear me okay? All right. So open your Bibles up to 2 Kings 13. Uh, I've accepted a full-time preaching ministry down there. It's a smaller church uh, that just needs some life breathed into it, and we are excited to be going down there. Uh, my wife uh, will be doing the same thing she's doing at St. Louis Christian College, but just for uh, nursing school down there, she'll be doing admissions. And so, man, you're just such a great, good-looking guy. <laughs> Got to be smarter than it is, I guess. And I'm not. All right, so, huh? Yeah. So anyway, so we're super excited about this move, and uh, but this week I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to see uh, all my wonderful friends, and uh, but let's just get into God's word and see what it has to tell us today. Second uh, Kings chapter 13, starting in verse 14. It says, "Now Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died." Jehoah. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. And he said, my father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck the ground five or six times when then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it, but now you will only defeat it three times. Uh, there's something about this story that just pops off the page for me. It just jumps out, and I think ultimately it's because one of two things. One is because it has a bow and arrow in it, and I love hunting, and I love uh, archery season, which starts September 15th, and uh, can't get here fast enough. Uh, just loins, you know, that's all I think about sometimes. And uh, Or it could be because Elisha is one of my favorite Bible heroes in Scripture. Now, I'm sure that El uh, jo Joash, Jehoash, isn't a Bible character that many of you guys have ever even heard of. But hopefully after today's message, he'll be someone that you relate to, that you'll understand about, and you, maybe you won't forget. And anybody, anytime somebody can actually pronounce Jehoash, you'll be like, oh, I know that guy. Uh, but we first read about him in 2 Kings 13, but in verse 11, where it says, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did not turn away from any of the sins Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He continued in them. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, out of all the things that scriptures could say about you, the one thing you don't want scripture to say is, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's not one that you want put in, in scripture as a legacy to go down. But I think a lot of times, you know, if we, if we don't fully surrender to God, then we're going to be continuing in the sins of the world. Now jump with me to verse 14. Elisha's dying. Jehoash is paying his respects to an icon. Now, 
he even pays him with a compliment. He says, my father, my father. He's not like really loving him. He's basically saying, you're the man. You are the man. And then he gives him, he, he finishes off with something Elisha was known by. It was a nickname. And it was the horsemen and chariots of Israel. Because in chapter 6, we see Elisha pray and God strikes an entire army blind and Elisha leads this entire army into Israel by himself. So it's like he's a one-man army. And so he gets this nickname, Elisha, the horsemen and chariots of Israel. You are a one-man army is basically the, the interpretation of that nickname. And so then, and so Today we have Chuck Norris jokes. Now, these are my top 10 fav favorite Chuck Norris jokes because anytime you think of someone tough, you know, like Elisha, Chuck Norris always comes to mind. And so these are my top 10 favorite. Uh, there used to be a street named Chuck Norris, but it was changed because nobody could cross it and live. Chuck Norris and Superman once fought. The loser had to wear their underwear on the outside of their pants. Number three, Chuck Norris has already been to Mars. That's why there's no any signs of life. Chuck Norris is the reason Waldo is hiding. <laughs> I just love that one. Okay, Chuck Norris can slam a revolving door. <laughs> Chuck Norris once kicked a horse in the chin. Its descendants are known as giraffes. Chuck Norris once got bit by a rattlesnake, and after three days of excruciating pain, the snake died. All right, Chuck Norris once won the Indianapolis 500 in a Fred Flintstone car. Chuck Norris can put out fire using gas. Chuck Norris once shot down a terrorist plane by pointing his finger at it and going, bang. <laughs> I just love Chuck Norris jokes. Elisha was an instrument used by God to do extraordinary things. And if Elisha said to Chuck Norris, jump, Chuck Norris would say, yes, sir, how high? That's who Elisha is. Or, but Jehoash in his heart, he isn't into this whole God thing. He doesn't want to have anything to really do with God, but he comes to pay his respects because Elisha is dying. But all this God talk is lost on him. He's more into himself than anything else, so Elisha, knowing all about the political issues that Jehoash is going through with Aram, he tells him to do something. He says, go get that bow. And so I'm sure maybe because... Jehoash isn't going to be traveling alone. He's probably got, you know, lots of bodyguards with him. And so he probably goes to a bodyguard, gets a bow and gets an arrow. And he goes back to where Elijah, Elisha's sitting. And in my mind, he's sitting on the bed. And, uh, and there's probably this, you know, uh, big window that he can look out. And, and, and Jehoash sits next to him. And Elisha reaches over and he touches him. He puts his hands on him. Now... This might not sound like a big deal, like, oh, okay. So the king sat down, and Elisha laid his hands on, his, on the king's hands. That, that's, that's cool. But if we would go back a few chapters, we read, or go ahead a few verses, we will read that Elisha's been dead a while. He's in his tomb, and some guys are just burying a body. Uh, it's their job. Not like, hey, we killed this guy. Let's bury the body somewhere. Uh, but he, they're burying the body, and they come into the cemetery, and they see some raiders coming. And so they get really scared. They're like, what do we do with this body? Well, hey, there's a hole. There's a tomb right there. Let's throw him in there. So they throw him in Elisha's tomb. The dead body touches Elisha's bones, and it comes back to life. So this touch is a big deal. Here Elisha is touching the king, signifying that if the king chooses to live for God, anything is possible. After touching the king, Elisha tells him to open the window, take an arrow, and shoot it out the window. So Jehoash, Jehoash basically says, okay. So Jehoash walks over to the window, pulls the arrow back, lets it fly, and it just goes. And, and so he comes back, sits down next to the king, or to Elisha. And he's humoring this old man. And then he tells the king to grab some arrows. So the king, you know, he gets a few more arrows from one of his guards. And he sits down and, and Elisha says, now take those arrows and strike the ground. 
So the, the king, who's probably sitting by the bedside, you know, he just takes these arrows and, and he strikes the ground and he's probably thinking, okay, now what, you silly old man? And uh, Elisha gets upset. I mean, it, he's just... The king probably is not expecting this, but Elisha gets upset, and Elisha says, you should have struck the ground five or six or seven times because then you would have completely destroyed your enemy. But because you only struck it three times, you're only going to defeat your enemy three times. You see, it's, it's not just that Jehoash is missing out. Please understand that Jehoash's lack of passion... When it came to obeying God, affected an entire nation. Souls would be lost for eternity. Now, we might not be a king affecting an entire nation, but our life affects others. And when we live it out for Christ, there's going to be a ripple effect. And that ripple effect will, will change those who are around us, either for the good or for the bad. And so, for Jehoash and his lack of passion, his lack of being sold out for God, it's going to affect an entire nation, and this upsets Elisha. He only strikes the ground three times, so three times his enemy will be beat. If he had taken it seriously, he would have totally destroyed them. But the same goes for us. If we would, with passion, put on the full armor of God every single day, we would destroy the power of the enemy and think for just a moment how many lives would be saved if you lived out your faith. If every day you put on the full armor of God and you, before you even got out of bed, you're like, God, let me be an instrument made holy and useful for you today, God. And then you get out of bed, and everywhere you go, you look at it as an opportunity to be Christ. It's almost as if, if Christ could possess your body and live and talk through you, what would he say and what would he do? Where would he go? I think every morning, if we would allow God to, to live through us, if we would take our life seriously and, and with faith live it out loud, think how many people would be saved. But you might say, hold on a second, Jehoash did what he was told to do. Elisha didn't say how many times to strike the arrows. And you're right, he didn't. But I believe a godly king might have said to Elisha, Sir, I want to make sure I do this right. How many times should I strike the ground just because I want to appease God? A godly king would have continued to strike the ground until he was told to stop. A godly king would have been so sold out for God that he would have wanted to go over and above what was asked of him. Kind of like when, when Jesus is washing his disciples' feet and he gets to Peter and Peter says, Oh, I can't let you wash my feet. And he says, If I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And what's Peter say? He's like, well, then wash my hands, wash my head, wash all of me. He's going over, but I don't want to miss out on anything that God wants. I want, when I stand before God, to have, have everything that God has ever offered. I don't, I don't know if you've heard that, the story about the guy who died and went to heaven, and, and he's up there, and, and God says, here, I want to show you a room, and he takes him to this room, and there's just all these presents, all these blessings all around this room, all in, you know, these beautifully wrapped Christmas type boxes. And he goes, well, what is this? And he said, this is all the blessings you could have had if you would have just lived your life for me. How many blessings do we miss out on because we're not sold out for God? I want everything that God has to offer. There is an interesting verse in 2 Chronicles six nineteen that says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So here's the thing. God is looking for anyone who is fully committed to him. It says his eyes are searching to, to, to and fro. And so the question comes, if God is searching to and fro to see whose hearts are totally sold out for him, would his gaze, Paul, was his, would his gaze fall upon you? 
Would he, would he be looking and then all of a sudden he sees you and be like, oh, there's someone fully committed. It was, it was not wishful thinking that drives godly people. It's a faith-filled thinking that says, if God wants me to be fully committed to him, I only have one question. How many times can I strike the ground with these arrows? Because I don't want to miss out on any of God's blessings in my life. I want to, be fully, I want to fully defeat my enemy. Do you ever feel like you're not fully defeating your enemy? Do you ever feel, do you ever hear Satan whispering in your ear, ha, sucker, you did it again. You call yourself a Christian? That's, that's his, his accent. That's how he talks to me. <laughs> you idiot, you moron, you call yourself a Christian, and yet you, you still give in to these same sins. I got you again. And you just call yourself a child of God? Yeah, he's definitely inner city. <laughs> but it's those days that I'm totally sold out for him, that I get into God's word, I'm praying, I'm not just going through the motions, I'm studying God's word, that all of a sudden, man, I'll go through the whole day and I just feel so amazingly blessed. I've never regretted it. I've never regretted not watching TV, but listening to a sermon on instead. And I've got to listen to a lot of sermons because I wanted to be prepared to come up with the mixtape thing you know, but I didn't know it was necessarily like a mix of preachers, and so I'm, so in my mind, which is super cool, in my mind, I thought, oh, when I was younger, a mixtape was something that you take all your favorite songs, and you put them on a tape, or you take all your girlfriend's favorite songs, or love songs that you want her to hear, you know, and you put them on a a mixtape, and then you give it to to someone special or you just it's for your car and you can listen to your favorite songs over and over and over uh many of you have no idea what i'm talking about <laughs> you're like well i got pandora and all my wife just she has like amazon prime music thing that she just put on my my phone and she made a whole list for me i, I have not figured that out yet on how to use that but anyway it's a mixtape so I was like, okay, how am I going to take this idea of mixtape and apply it to my verse today? And I thought, oh, I got it. I think a lot of times as Christians, like, Jehoah, like Jehoash, he, uh, he, he could pick and choose what he wanted to do. And, and I, how many times do we pick and choose what verses we want to focus on? And how many times we're like, yeah, I'm not going to listen to that verse. I don't want to hear that verse. And so, of course, we're not going to put like a Billy Idol song on, right? You know, so we're, we're going to put stuff on in our life that we, we like, that doesn't step on our toes. And so we pick and choose. We create a mixtape or a mixed life with God's word. If we don't want that verse on there in our life and in our heart, we're not going to put it on there. So I thought, well, that's how I could blend it in. But it's different. So anyway, so someone asked me why Christians aren't excited and passionate about their faith nowadays, but it's not a nowadays issue. Some people today think that it doesn't really matter what they do because... It's not going to change anything. And Jehoash was thinking, what difference does, I, does it make if I shoot an arrow out of a, a stupid window or strike the ground? What does it matter? Well, what matters is here's a man of God telling you to do it, who's speaking for the Lord, and he could have totally defeated his enemies, but because he went through the motions, because he thought, what difference does it make Now he's only going to defeat his enemies three times. What difference does it make? A lot of this comes from how we've been raised. Many people think about Christianity as coming to church building and listening to a sermon, singing some songs, putting some money in an offering plate, taking some communion, sharing a few handshakes, and then going home. And that is pretty much all they do for God. And the rest of the week we live for ourselves. And we think... Check, did that, check, did that. We just go through the motions, but we're not passionately in love with God when we're doing that. But that's what God's wanting us to because God wants us to get the full blessings that he has to offer. Everything. But yet, we're just going through the motions. They've hit the ground three times with the arrows, and that's, that's it because... That's what they've been raised to think Christianity is all about. This is what God's asked of me. This is what I'm going to do. Check. 
Because isn't that all Christianity is? We come here, we, we sit, we do our thing, and then we leave, and, and then we're thinking about work, we're thinking about all these other things. But we should be thinking about how we can fit God in every aspect of our life. You mean God wants me to, like, you know, surround every aspect of my life with him? Uh, yeah. If Jesus is who he says he is, did what he said he did, there is no greater truth more worthy of your time. And everyone who has ever been sold out for Christ and lived their life for him out loud will say, I have no regrets. There is no regrets in my life because I went over and above. I don't want to just read the Bible like the preacher tells me. I want to study it. I want to look for every last thing. Sometimes I'll read the Bible out loud to my family like I read it in my head. And... Uh, and it just becomes a big, long lesson. <laughs> because everything, I notice everything. Because I want to. Because I don't want to just read it. I want to study it. I want, I want it to absorb. If I could lay this on my head at night or put it under my pillow and let it absorb into me, I would. Luke 17, 7 through 10 says, so Jesus, Jesus talking. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after a sheep. Would he say to that servant, when he comes in from the field... Come along now and sit down to eat. Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat? Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? No. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. If we only do what we have to do, we are unworthy servants. Or another way of saying it, I only struck the ground three times with my arrows. I've done nothing beyond the minimum requirements. At least that's all I thought God wanted me to do. There's a singer, he's probably one of my favorite singers, but he has a song that, it's, it's an amazing sermon and it's amazing prayer, really, but I'm not going to sing it to you, but here's the lyrics. Matthew West, the, the song is titled, I Don't Want to Go Through the Motions. He writes, this might hurt, it's not safe, but I know I've got to make a change. I don't care if I break, at least I'll be feeling something, because just okay is not enough. Help me fight through the nothingness of life. Because I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? No regrets. Not this time. I'm going to let my heart defeat my mind. Let your love make me whole. I think I'm finally feeling something, because just okay is not enough. Help me fight through the nothingness of life, because I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I had given everything? What if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? I think if we, if we would put that like, what if I had given everything, what would my life be like? Maybe we could say stuff like, if I had given everything, if I hadn't gone through the motions, I would still be married to the first woman. My children would be saved if I hadn't just gone through the motions. If I hadn't gone through the motions, I maybe wouldn't have gotten fired. My best friend wouldn't have committed suicide. I wouldn't have been addicted to drugs. If I hadn't gone through the motions, I wouldn't have become an alcoholic. If I had given everything, then maybe I wouldn't have dropped out of college. I, I wouldn't have argued with my spouse as much as I did. They would have been able to see Christ in me if I hadn't just gone through the motions. And so now you're left asking, what if I had given everything? 
How would my life be different? Who would be saved that isn't saved? Because I kept my mouth shut and I just gone through the motions. I kept my Christianity to one day a week. In our story today, we have two guys that are on completely different ends of the spectrum. We have Elisha on this side who has given everything for the Lord. But then on this side, you have Jehoash who isn't giving anything. And I think between these two spectrums, there we lie. It just so happened one time I was reading uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. I don't know if you've ever even heard of that book. It's, a, it's an entire book filled with people who have died for their faith. It's an awesome book, and it's not very expensive. You can get the paperback. But here I'm reading this amazing book about these people that are sold out for Christ to the point that they've given their life for him, and their testimonies are awesome. But then I'm also reading at the same time, another, not like some, I'll read one sentence from each one. I, I'm reading one in the morning, one at night. In the other, in the other book, the book was titled um, Christian Atheist. Christian atheist. Basically, it's basically saying, I, I, I want God, but I'm, I'm not going to live like it. It's like you can't tell the difference, you know, between a, the Christian and the atheist. It's like if I came to your house and I looked on your shelf at your movies and the books on your shelf, would I see any difference from your stuff than if I went to a non-Christian atheist house and I looked at his movies and his books? Would there be any difference between the two? That's the point of the book. And so here on one end, I'm, li I'm reading people giving their entire life for Christ and dying. And then people who just, meh, I'll, I'll just go through the motions. And I'm, I'm a Christian, but the world doesn't even know. So they probably think I'm an atheist. There's no, I think sometimes maybe we're in the middle somewhere. We, we, we get excited at points like, you know, and uh, but then all of a sudden things will happen and we're back down here. And then, you know, it's like a roller coaster. And so I think we're 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 battling between these two spectrums. But we're not the only ones. I mean, we see in Scripture the, the Israelites, they were in the wilderness for for how long? Forty years. Why? Because of their lack of faith. They didn't get to go into the promised land. I don't know if you realize that, but that whole story, that's also our story. Because the promised land is also known as God's rest. We can enter into God's rest. Well, how do you enter into God's rest? The same way the Israelites entered into the promised land. Well, how is that? Faith. When you have faith, you have to surrender. When you surrender, then you can go in faith but they were afraid so they didn't and so they were in this area now it's not non-christian we're, we're in the wilderness we're in this area but this area isn't necessarily bad their shoes never wore out god provided manna from heaven he provided water from a rock i mean the wilderness wasn't a bad area god provided for them but it wasn't this it wasn't the promised land, was it? I think our life is the same way. I think we live in here, and, and there's times that if we would just have faith and surrender, we would be able to experience how God's word is true. How God's word is true. Parents, grandparents, we need to live in such a way that we show our children that it works, that God's word works. So when it says to be virgins when you get married. Oh, we don't want to do that. Don't live together before you're married. We don't want to do that. But if we, if we actually practiced it, we should show them that, look, God's word works. He says, wait until you're married. And then we'll see that it works. Did you know nine out of ten people who have sex before marriage get a divorce? Nine out of ten I don't know if you know the Nick game of Russian roulette where you, you, know, you have 10 bullets and you take one out, then you spin it. That's what you're doing with your relationship. We need to be living in such a way that we could say to our children, this works. This works. And so show them that it works. My phone has to get my picture 
my face before it all opened. It just closed. One time I woke up in the morning and I was so dishuffled that my phone's like didn't even recognize me. I'm like, oh, it's not opening. Ah. Oh. So I had to get ready before I could open my phone. Just kidding. I just punched in the number. Okay, let's keep going. If we want to have victory in our life over any and every difficulty, then we need to fervently and passionately and with excitement do the things that God wants us to do. Don't just read your Bible. Don't just pray. Don't just go to church. Don't just go through the motions. There are churches out there that are satisfied with the status quo. I interviewed in a church just uh, right outside of Joplin once. I was probably in my 20s, and uh, of course, I'm no different than I was then, just more gray hair and more weight, and so uh, I was just as passionate, and, and, and uh, this church knew that because, you know, 10 years prior, I was their youth minister, and we had, we took 65 kids to you know a youth event that was typical we had more kids coming to youth group than we had people coming to church so this this church knew what kind of passion i was trying to get everybody to have and one of the elders said we know how you are but what if we don't want to grow and i looked at him and i said then i would not want to be you when i stand before god Obviously, I didn't accept the ministry. <laughs> they probably wouldn't have hired me anyway. But then I was at another church, and I was the minister, and we grew from 40 to 150, 175 in two years. And I had, and you hear stories like this, but this actually, you know, it, I'm like, oh, that never happens to me. I, go, I hear stories like that, but this actually happened where the lady came in after church, and she said, I don't like coming here anymore. And I just... You know, there's too many people. I don't know them. I don't want to know them. I just want the church to go back the way it was. What? Does she not see all the baptisms and all the lives that were changed? She wants it to go back to 30 and 40 people? But I don't think she's alone. I, don't, I think there's people out there that are okay with the status quo, and not just the status quo of the church, but the status quo of their life. Oh, I've given enough for God. This, this was enough. We've just done enough. If you were an employer, would you be okay if your employees just did enough? Or would you want an employee that took, went over and above? Who are you going to want to hire? Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says, Just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust him too for each day's problems. Live in vital union with him. Let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. I love that verse. Exodus 30, 34, 14 says, You must worship only the Lord, for he is passionate about his relationship with you. Romans 12, 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. If I've ever met you not at church, guess what we're going to end up talking about? <laughs> you know it. Because he's all that matters. Paul is warning us, never become lukewarm about our relationship with God. Never become, live it out. When people come to church, here's an opportunity for you to be Christ. One of the very first things I'm going to teach not just our elders, but our entire congregation at this church, is that every Sunday when you come here, you are a greeter. Sure, we have, you know, I've been at churches where there was greeter meetings, where greeter training, you come, to, you come if you want to be a greeter and shake people's hands and hand them a bulletin and say, I'm so happy you're here. And then they teach you things not to say. And, uh, but we have greeter training. But one of the things... I'm going to teach this church the very first thing will be every one of you are greeters. Every one of you. How, how fast would the church grow if we actually, one, invited people, but two, when they did come, we would notice, oh, hey, we got a new people here. When I was in youth, when I was in youth ministry, we had a big youth ministry, and so I would notice people that were new. And so when I'm given announcements, we always had a Q 
key word because I had core youth in my youth group who, you know, they, they're the ones that planned everything. And uh, so it was really a youth-led youth ministry. I was just kind of supervising. But anytime I saw new students come and I was giving announcements, we'd always have a, a, a code word. And so I'd say, hey, don't forget, you know, we're going to have pickles tonight or, or don't. Did anybody eat a pickle when they went home after, you know, it was just a stupid thing, you know. But it, it worked. It, was, it wasn't something everybody was expecting. But if you, if you were a, a normal attender, you would know that that was the code word for, hey, look around to see who is new. And then everybody after youth group would go and, and welcome them and invite them back. That was my youth group. What if we did that as a church? What if we had a, a code word like frog legs or, you know, or something weird that if you heard it, it would trigger something in you. But in reality, we shouldn't even need code words. We should be looking. We should, one, be inviting, but we should be looking. And then when we do have a visitor, my elders and deacons were trained that if they saw a visitor, whoever, it was their job to invite that person out to lunch. It was their job to invite the person. And so there was one guy named Bill Slaughter and another guy named Dale Loveland. And uh, uh, one was an elder, one was a deacon, but it was so great that I, I would be at, you know, at church and everybody's filing in, you know, and I'd look up and I'd see a new person come in the door and I'd see Bill Slaughter would notice, and Dale Loveland would notice, and it was so great to, because it was almost like they looked at each other, and it was almost like a race to see who could get to the visitor first to invite them out to lunch. Man, if there's anything that would make God's heart happy, it's that kind of competition, just to learn who they are and get to plant seeds and help them to grow closer to Christ. Let me wrap this up. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was a burglar that did something quite unusual. He, he kicked in the door of the house. That was, nor that was normal, as usual. <laughs> but when he got in, he, he gathered all these electronics and he put them in this bag and he came out, but then the neighbor saw him and the neighbor called the police. And of course he started running. The police finally got, found him and he started running, but it was straight towards the Arkansas River. It's winter, the river's cold, and he, he runs to the river and he jumps in with the bag of electronics. And this is probably before they knew about rice. <laughs> so he jumps in with this bag of electronics. And, uh, you know, there's a fisherman, Mike Branson. He, he's noticing this guy. And uh, the guy, he said that the guy went under once. And, of course, the police are on shore trying to talk him in. And some policemen are taking off their, their gear to try to jump in the water to save him. But he said he went down once and then twice. And the third time, he never came back up. He never came up. 30 minutes later, when they finally fished him up, his hand was still clutched to the bag of electronics. The weight of that drug him under. But how many, how many of us, how many of us are clutching onto the things of this world with relentless passion? I'm sure you've heard of how they catch monkeys, right? You, you know how they catch monkeys? They tie a, a, a chain around a tree. They screw that chain to a, a coconut that they've drilled a hole in, but it's a small hole, just big enough for the monkey to stick his hand in. But then they put marbles inside of the, of the coconut. And so the monkey will see the, the shiny things inside the coconut. He'll stick his hands in and he'll grab those marbles, but he won't let them go. So no matter how hard he fights, he can't, he can't break the chain, he can't get it off the coconut, but he, he's, not, he's not smart enough to just let him go and pull his hand out. But aren't we sometimes too? Don't we grab onto the things of life, maybe things that are shaped like this? And we just it, clutch it in our hands? Have you ever, I mean, it's hard to see people not with one of these, right? It's always in our hand. But this doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I mean, we can use it for God's glory, but a lot of times, I'll be honest with you, we don't. <laughs> We're scrolling TikToks for two or three hours. I mean, who, who hasn't done that? Praise God, you were awesome. <laughs> He's like, well, what's TikTok? <laughs> you know, but it's true. But how would the world be different? How would this church be different? 
if we clutched onto the Word of God and we scrolled it for two or three hours with passionate fervor to know Him more and to be known by Him. I'm going to wrap this up with a, a prayer. If you have a decision to make, I challenge you to come forward. But here's the thing. Ultimately, don't go through the motions. If you've been going through the motions in your life, you've got to stop. Because we don't know. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. And we know that someday we're going to stand before God. And I pray that you desire not just for God to say, well done and good and faithful servant. But for God to say, hey, it's so glad to see you. Come on in. Let me give you a hug. I know you so well. Thanks for getting to know me. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we came here this morning despite the, the things that this world has to offer and the whispers in the ear, but sometimes, Father, we, we go through the motions. We sit down, we sing songs, we maybe say a couple howdy-do's, but then we leave and we go back to our home, still clutching bags of junk. Please, Father God, help us to have a thirst help us to have a hunger for you that is unquenchable we love you Lord we thank you for this church we thank you for the amazing elders and deacons we pray and thank you for uh, Robert and everyone else and I pray that you would just continue to help us to draw closer to you we love you Jesus and all God's children said We're going to continue our time of worship. If you'd like to stand as we respond to what we've heard this morning, one of the things in this song is that it talks about our praise ever being on our lips. And as we strive to live in a way that those around of us are around us are constantly seeing Jesus through us, and one of those ways is through um, just through praising Him in all that we do, in all that we live, and all that we say. So, if you need to pray with someone this morning, we invite you to forward and you can meet with Jason or you can go in the back. We've got Dave in the back and Robert around here somewhere. Um, or you can meet with one of us after as well. And we can talk with you and pray with you. Um, but for now, let's just spend a little more time praising him. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon like a mercy for today faithful you
thank you. We thank you for being the one that we praise, the reason we praise, and the reason that we live a life of praise. God, we just give that up to you this morning. We pray in your son's name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Joe, friend, thank you for your wonderful message. We appreciate you being here today, and you are a true friend. We love you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Messed up my papers. In just a couple of minutes, we will continue our time of worship by giving. We have a number of giving options you can give the offering plate, which we will bring around in a few minutes, or you can give online. You can give online by visiting highhillchristianchurch.org slash forward give. You can also mail a check to 852 Boons Lake Road, High Hill, Missouri, 63350. No matter how you give, we are grateful for your generosity that allows us to connect with God connect with others, and connect others with God each week. I want to share a verse of scripture written by the Apostle Paul and directed to some Christians who lived in the first century city of Corinth. It is a verse about money, but I hope it gives you a sense of freedom today because we're not about the money, we're not after money. In fact, we want something for you more than we want something from you. Here's what Paul says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountiful will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as he has decided on his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. It's a great verse. Essentially, it says, if you, want, if, you want, if you plant a little, you will get a little. If you plant a lot, you will get a lot. And it's not just about a rule or regulation or meeting some ex expectations. It's about your heart. I'll be honest, there are times I wish we could compel you to give. But God doesn't want that for us, and he doesn't want it for you either. He wants you to be a cheerful giver. I know so many people in our church who feel blessed because they do give. They reap bountifully because they are generous. That's, why we, that's what we, exactly what we want for you, all of you. So I'm going to pray, and then we will have the opportunity to give if you, as you have decided in your own heart. Let's pray. God, thank you that we get to give. Thank you that our generosity is changing lives here in this church, our communities, and around the world. Bless us as we give today so that we can be a blessing to others. And it's that simple. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, so you get to hear Dave preach uh, next week, so make sure you're all here for that. Uh, he's... He's already sent me a sermon draft, uh, so make sure you have tissues because it's going to be kind of an emotional day. Um, but it's going to be really good. So make sure uh, you're here next week. It'll be the last week of our summer mixtape message series. Uh, Dave will be wrapping that up for us. And then the next week we'll start a new series called God Is uh, through the month of August. Um, also on the first Sunday in August, on August 1st, we're doing a State of the Church uh, meeting. And that meeting is to communicate to you uh, what we've been doing uh, with uh, Converge, with our Natural Church Discipline Survey, um, and the results of that, and, and the plans uh, for the future, some of the plans for the future uh, that we have. So make sure that you are here next Sunday to hear Dave, and then the Sunday after that, uh, after this service, around noonish, uh, we'll provide lunch and childcare for you to stay after um, 
for that State of the Church meeting. Also, uh, the first Saturday in August, like always, is our men's breakfast, so make sure you're here for that. Uh, and then also that day is our Back to School Bash. Uh, so if you can help us out uh, with that by purchasing school supplies, there's still some bags at Connecting Point for you to be able to do that, uh, as well as we're going to need about 100 volunteers that day uh, to make that event happen. So if you can help us serve uh, with that, that would be awesome. Uh, we're also starting a new U version plan. It's on your bulletin. It's a seven day guide to prayer. If you'd like to be reading that along with us, you can scan this QR code and read along with us. But lots of opportunities for you to get connected. Uh, make sure you're checking out your bulletin, checking out Facebook, checking out the website, all of those things so that you know what's happening in the life of our church. But right now, we're going to stand up to our feet and we'll sing one more song before we're dismissed. Like I said at the 9 a.m. service, I said that sounds like a whole lot of opportunity to go out and be greeters in the world and to serve one another and to serve the community um, and to just share your life of praise with them and so and with each other. So as we go out, I just want to um, kind of send us out in a spirit of praise. And we're going to sing the chorus of one of the songs we sing at the beginning that just says, Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God.